Paul Smith, a fellow of the IT and a one-time promoter of the real science behind climate change. I did my last talk in New Zealand just over five years ago and much has happened since then so I thought that now, after the shindig of world leaders in Paris, just might be a good time to do an update. But first, a recap. When I did my talks on climate change, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, had produced only two reports and the third was imminent. I cheekily summarised these three voluminous reports, really thick reports, chronologically as, well, it might be happening, followed by, it probably is happening and man is likely to blame, and it's happening and it's too late to do anything about it. I'd say now, in the same vein, that we've realised that it's happening and we're scrambling to do something about it, but we're going to have to adapt because it's probably already too late. Much of what I said in my talks has started to happen. And there's one thing that nobody can argue with. Carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere have risen from a pre-industrial level of around 260 parts per million to about 400 now. In prehistory, the Earth hasn't experienced more than about 300 parts per million for over 400,000 years. Now that's worth thinking about. In a science fiction novel by Kim Stanley Robinson titled 2312, our current era is termed the dithering by the lead character, and indeed it has been. There are still climate change doubters, of course, but one thing I'll say about science is it really doesn't care whether you believe it or not. The science process is one based upon facts, not beliefs, and the facts are becoming irrefutable. The science process tests hypotheses, accepting those that stand up and rejecting those that don't. So question by all means, but don't question the scientific process. It's better than anything else in human endeavour. So whilst Western Europe and lately in America and China installed wind turbines and filled their fields with solar photovoltaic cells and talked of the decline of coal, oil and gas, greenhouse gases have risen relentlessly faster than in the 1980s or 90s. 2014 was the hottest year on record and in the decade average temperatures are nearly a degree higher than they were in the decade of 1818. Whilst the International Energy Agency estimates that over 13% of the world's primary energy comes from biofuels, the figure is misleading. It mostly means burning of wood, animal dung and charcoal in poor countries. The real picture is really quite different. What we would think of as biofuels like wind, solar, tidal and geothermal produce less than one and a half percent, that's one and a half percent, and nuclear around five percent, and this is falling. The Kyoto Protocol of 1997, that's 1997, achieved little and became unworkable. It's expired now in any case. A quarter of a century of absolutely nothing of substance has been achieved. Now, we have a sister planet called Venus. Its surface temperature is over 450 degrees Celsius. That's hotter than Mercury, which is the Sun's nearest planet. The reason? A runaway greenhouse gas effect, because the atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide. Now, nobody is suggesting that we're heading for this on Earth. But a reminder that we're playing with things that we really can't control. So what do we want? Well, the consensus is that global temperatures should not be allowed to rise by more than two degrees Celsius above those of pre-industrial levels. To use Al Gore's expression, an inconvenient truth is that most of the climate models show that we are already heading for a temperature rise of more than two degrees Celsius. The models show that to meet a two degree target, 
the world can emit no more than 3,200 gigatons of carbon dioxide and we're at 2,000 right now. At our current rate the CO2 budget will be consumed in about 30 years. There is some good news. The global slowdown and some energy efficiency measures mean that emissions in 2014 were about the same as 2013 and could be even lower in 2015. Unfortunately though that's not enough. China may burn less coal but India will burn more and many countries, poor countries, want to be rich and they'll do so like we did by burning fossil fuels. When I started giving these climate change talks the USA was the largest emitter of carbon dioxide by a long way. Now China leads but we needn't pat ourselves on the back not too much anyway because what we've done is simply exported our manufacturing and our emissions problem. Of course climate change will not be bad for everybody and everything. Once cold climates will suddenly become warmer and they will be able to grow things that they couldn't grow before and their seasons will be longer. Some will see fish migrate into their waters and be able to fish them. Britain stands out exceptionally favoured with its ocean moderated climate and early reports that the Gulf Stream may cease seem to have been unfounded. Yet the bad effects outnumber the benign effects and those that can't adapt inevitably the poorer regions will suffer the most. Renewable energy is crucial but the current subsidies are misplaced. Government has a lousy record of choosing market winners and yes we should be paying for the research and then let the market decide once the research is done. Maybe also we should be using taxation or charges to level the playing field for those who pollute who are causing the climate change problems in the first place. Crucially, and this is really important, mankind will have to adapt. We're going to be living in a world with higher greenhouse gas concentrations and that will mean some uncomfortable decisions like changing our diets, deliberately abandoning parts of the world, yes abandoning, taking steps to reduce our population and yes using engineering to solve the climate change problem, to reduce the concentrations of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. I've said some negative things about renewable power so I want to put them into context. Renewable power is good but more renewable power isn't necessarily better. Let's look at some facts. At the millennium coal produced 1000 132 gigawatts of electricity. That's at the millennium. In 2014 it produced 1980 gigawatts despite the advance of renewable sources of energy. Coal generates 41 percent, 41 percent of the world's electricity and 30 percent of all of its energy needs. China is responsible for most of the rise in coal as it has industrialized. Coal is twice as polluting as natural gas. The West has in effect exported its manufacturing and emissions to China and other developing countries. Wind and sunshine have two drawbacks, especially in Britain. The first is that they are erratic. Germany's renewable output can be 3% on a poor weather day or it can be nearly 55% if the conditions are favourable. The second problem, oddly, is that the marginal cost of the energy, like nuclear, is free. That's not to say that the levelised cost is free. Taking into account building and capital cost, it's more expensive than fossil based fuels. But the energy markets see this quite differently. A surge in wind power or solar power pushes down the clearing price. Solar and wind are chosen first and then nuclear and then the cheaper and dirty lignite coal leaving cleaner gas and less clean coal looking for a taker. 
They sit idle, generating electricity, not using it, and generating pollution. Germany's biggest error was to ignore the fact that wind and solar power impose costs on the entire system and those costs go up as they add more capacity. The attempt to avert climate change by cutting emissions has not yet started, not really, but adaption is well underway. Here's some examples. Some of them help, but not all of them. Between 1993 and 2009, the percentage of American homes with air conditioning rose from nearly 68% to 87%. California has had to cope with a four year long drought and San Diego now uses desalination for its fresh water needs. Sub-Saharan farmers are diversifying away from wheat to sorghum which is more drought resistant. Bringing down emissions of greenhouse gases asks people to make sacrifices today for future generations. Adaption doesn't. It plays to mankind's strengths, that's self-preservation and survival. This is probably the most intelligent response to climate change so far. A decade ago, adaption was taboo, but now it's recognised as important. Another taboo and underfinanced area is that of geoengineering. That's to reverse the effects of climate change using engineering. Some consider it to be costly or dangerous or both, but I think it deserves more consideration than it has so far received. The most obvious approach would be to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. It would also help reverse the acidification of the oceans and help the marine ecosystem. There are many ways of achieving this geoengineering and I described some in my lecture tour many years ago. Here's a list, it's not exhaustive and money needs to be spent researching techniques and then again let the market decide. Carbon Absorbing minerals like olivine could be mined and spread out so they would absorb the carbon from the atmosphere. Lime or limestone could be dipped into the ocean to react with the dissolved carbon dioxide. Iron and other nutrients could be added to the water to stimulate algal growth as they feed on carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide removed from power station stacks or from the air. We could encourage the growth of crustaceans or even insects as it's pretty clear that life fixes carbon. And there are many, many other methods. Two contradictory criticisms are often levelled at geoengineers. The first is the methods are costly and couldn't be deployed on a large enough scale. And secondly, that if the procedures are introduced, they would lead to a moral hazard why bother cutting emissions today if we can remove them tomorrow? And then came along the Paris Agreement of December the 12th, 2015. It was stronger than many expected. All 195 countries agreed to keep the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius, above pre-industrial levels, and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to one and a half degrees. There was also a commitment to a net zero emissions by the second half of the century. The 187 countries have vowed to make what they call intended nationally determined contributions or a term you'll hear, INDCs. Again, the awkward fact is that these are not strong enough to ensure the one and a half degree pledge is honoured. In fact, the Paris pledges will lead to an average warming of three degrees Celsius. There's already been around a one degree of warming and the measures required to achieve the one and a half degree target would indeed need to be heroic. The reality is 
that to stick to the one and a half degree target will require that some of the carbon dioxide be sucked back out of the atmosphere. Reforestation will help, but other technologies are essential. Even so, let me not say otherwise, progress has been made. And this is the first time that this has been so in a quarter of a century. One promising technology is carbon capture and storage. The gathering up of CO2 and storing it underground. Extracting CO2 from burnt fuel is complex, costly, energy intensive and risky. CO2 is not a waste product. It is the natural result of combustion. Dr. Thomas Wetzel of the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology thinks it better if the fuel is decarbonized before it is burnt. And this looks a promising technology for natural gas. The gas, mostly methane, is cracked, creating hydrogen, a clean fuel to be burnt. My last talk in New Zealand was to an audience committed and passionate about many environmental issues, of which climate change was but one. New Zealand hardly contributes at all to global greenhouse gas emissions. But the young people who quizzed me cared deeply about the future of the environment. I said then, and I stand by it now, that the planet is not in peril. I cited external threats like war and famine then, and the world situation has become even worse with the collapse of order in the Middle East. Nevertheless, climate change is a real threat, but not to the Earth. It'll adapt, but whether she can support a population of over 7 billion people, well, that's open to conjecture. It seems that Paris has achieved something and I'm hopeful that the inactivity has stopped. It may be too little and it may be too late, but it is a start. The science has spoken and is indifferent to whether you believe it or not. Science is above all of that. The scientific method is a basis for rational thought. What we know should allow policymakers to make the right decisions but each of us has a role to play. Consume less, make things last longer, don't expect your children to have the same lifestyle as we have had. The earth simply can't sustain it. Finally, and I said during my previous talks that the economy has to change too. And we lost a great opportunity to effect change when the greed of a few crashed the global financial system. We fluffed it. Maybe the next generation can do better. My thanks to the IPCC, BBC, Economist and to NASA for much of the background information used in this video. Thank you very much for watching.